Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, this is Dr. Garayas. This is MED 140, 70AX meets uh, Thursday mornings, 9 a.m. And we're recording this topic for week four session. Now, just a quick reminder, uh, quiz three and discussion three are due today. So if you have not done it, please do so. Because for every day uh, you do not post, you are deducted uh, one grade. And of course, review your blood pressure rubrics. And uh, um, if you have never done blood pressure before and don't know how to do it, don't worry. Uh, laboratory is coming soon in a couple of weeks. I will be also posting the laboratory times. And if you cannot make any of those times, uh, we also have a Saturday morning uh, uh, class for those of you who work during the week. Um, that will also be uh, made available. So look out in your announcements uh, up top. Here are your announcements here. Look out for your announcements for uh, lab times and email me back uh, as soon as the lab times are posted on uh, which lab time you're going because we have to have a sign-in sheet and uh, we're only allowed so many people in the laboratory at one time. So with that being said, let's jump to our textbook and uh, we're doing chapter 39 and it's this red orange book. Remember the blue book is, um, uh, what do you call that, all the procedures. But the red book too, if you notice at the end of the chapter, it has all the procedure rubrics. Now what's a rubric? A rubric is just a set of steps that, um, uh, that you must uh, be able to go through and uh, in order to get a grade in laboratory. And we'll also review that when you're in laboratory as well. So let's jump to uh, obstetrics and gynecology. That's uh, what we're gonna be talking about this week and what tests and uh, items are important and required. What do you mean there's no internet connection? Yeah, I'm up. Oh boy. Let's see what's going on here. This thing was up and running a second ago. There you go. So table of contents, we, uh, we scooch down to chapter 39. If it will let me. And it is assisting in reproductive and urinary specialties. Okay. Or did I get it backwards? Oh, here's some nice. Ugh, I think I got it backwards again. I clicked on the wrong book. It is the red book. I keep on thinking it's the blue book. So go into the table of contents and you should be going into the section that has all the clinical stuff, which is uh, not communication and it's definitely not administrative. Uh, therapeutics and diagnostics. You open up uh, this thing right here, and that's what tells you what number of chapters. Here you go, clinical practices and chapter 39. Again, I have to reiterate, it is the uh, orange or red book that's, um, that has the text, and um, it is the blue one that has, um, um, you know, um, extra multiple choice questions, and also it has all the, um, um, what do you call it, the rubrics. And I'll show you an example of the rubric regarding blood pressure. And if you already know how to take blood pressure, odds are you do the shortcut. But in our laboratory, we show you the, uh, the most proper way to take a blood pressure. So assisting in reproductive and urinary specialties, the two departments that you most likely will be doing reproductive and urinary specialties 
is uh, obstetrics and gynecology, also known as OBGYN, and or the Department of Urology, and even the Department of Nephrology uh, as well falls into that gap. Now, what's the difference between OBGYN and urology? Um, regarding uh, reproductive specialties, uh, obstetrics deals with uh, female uh, reproductive issues, and urology will typically deal with only male reproductive issues. But nowadays, uh, there's subspecialties, uh, um, uh, uroobstetrics, which, um, uh, you know, the obstetrician can see both male and female, because typically, uh, when uh, a couple comes in for um, fertility problems, they're going to come in together and, you know, separating them doesn't make much sense anymore. Uh, but, uh, but there are, but typically if it's only the male that has a problem, they go to the Department of Urology. And if uh, the female partner has a problem with reproductive, they go to the Department of Obstetrics. And the Department of Gynecology is for any other uh, female um, uh, related issues other than uh, childbirth. So let's look at our case. And we already know about subjective, objective assessment and plan. So we should be able to pick this apart. So we're looking at our patient, uh, Miss Raja Laatu, 42 year old woman. And again, it's missing her occupation. Let's see, nope. Here to see Dr. Uh, Williams arrived to the office with the annual gynecologic physical, physical and results of her mammogram. So she's coming in for a mammogram screening and uh, her, her yearly uh, physical. Now, that could be also the diagnosis if everything is normal, okay? Just coming in for uh, uh, annual or biannual physical. So she also had a mammogram. Now, a mammogram, if you uh, recall, is only a screening test. I remember uh, I stated in a lecture or two that there's a difference between screening and, oh, wait a minute, uh-oh. Oh, good, good, I'm, am I recording? Okay, yes, good. Whew, I had to make sure of that. Um, uh, or I'd have to do it all over again. Now, uh, the, there's the difference between um, a screening test and a definitive test. So she's having her, um, her uh, mammogram today. So she's going to go to the Department of uh, Diagnostic Medicine and or the Department of Radiology, and she's going to have a mammogram. There, uh, the mammogram is just a screening test, meaning to say is she's most likely asymptomatic. She doesn't feel any palpable mass on her monthly um, breast self-examination. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's good idea, especially uh, when she's getting older, to have a regular uh, uh, mammogram and also pap smear, which should be included in the gynecological physical examination. Now, the pap smear as well is also a screening test. So what do these things mean? It means if this digital mammogram is positive for something, right, it doesn't mean she has breast cancer. It means we have to go to the next step. And the next step is the definitive exam. And the definitive exam, if we find a mass upon mammogram, is biopsy. Same thing with the pap smear. If she has an abnormal pap smear, we'll repeat it and then, uh, and then take a biopsy of anything that we find um, on her cervix that seems to be abnormal. Okay, And the biopsy is the definitive test to say she has cervical cancer or she has breast cancer. We have to actually uh, take a... a um, the slang is we take a bite or we take a biopsy and uh, we send it to the Department of Pathology and or Oncology and they get back to us. And what we found? We found that there's a normal density close to the chest wall on her right breast. So that means there might be a mass. Uh, there's some breast tissue there that's a little bit on the dense side and breast tissue isn't supposed to be dense. So um, there's some we have to, we're most likely gonna do a biopsy. And then we're gonna see if it's fluid filled or solid, right? Uh, so the best way to look at that is an ultrasound. And an ultrasound, at times it's, uh, uh, it's, it's like, um, it's not really a screening test, but at times it's, 
it, it helps and aids the confirmatory test. So right now, the ultrasound now tells us that it's solid. Okay, so this is not a very good sign right now. So now we know we have a mass. The next thing we have to now do is FNAB, which is fine needle aspirational biopsy, right? And, it re and then we sent it and it revealed that she has grade two infiltrating ductal carcinoma. So the mammogram led us to the ultrasound and the ultrasound led us to the definitive biop biopsy. And that's how things work. And that's why it takes a while to get, um, um, to get the diagnosis. And now that we have a diagnosis, we can now uh, proceed forward, okay? So this is, a, this is a classic if we have some sort of finding. And remember, uh, typically screening tests are for asymptomatic patients, but now we've actually found a mass and that's actually uh, a sign that's actually objective data, so we have to complete the laboratory, okay? So think of her uh, when, uh, because don't you think that would be a good question on an exam? So, and actually, uh, that's actually how I ask questions on exams. I uh, use the, the cases. Now, what are some things that we're also looking for, especially in uh, older age? We're also looking for uh, menopause in a gynecological exam, and that's part of the subjective. Uh, you ask the patient, you know, how's your menstrual cycle? How has it been? For, and especially if uh, the patient is greater than 45 years of age. And if the patient is, has children and greater than, uh, greater than uh, 42 years of age, we're also looking at regular pap smears. And also, all day, every day, every month, right, uh, you should be promoting BSE or breast self-examination, which there, um, you can look up uh, the videos online, be able to know what that is, actually do it on yourself, and also be able to teach that to your patient because many times the patient will find the mass and they'll find something way before um, the obstetrician or gynecologist would. So here are some nice things that we, ha uh, that we should uh, be looking at that the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology um, uh, recommends. Pelvic exams, uh, that means the doctor has to uh, actually put you up on the stirrups and then uh, um, uh, look inside you either with a colposcope or uh, at least a, um, a, a digital examination where the, the doctor puts a gloved hand and then physically checks for any masses or um, any abnormalities. And again, uh, especially if the patient's sexually active, chlamydia screen or an STD screen like gonorrhea. Um, and HIV screening as well. So all of these things, and remember they're screening, they're asymptomatic. So uh, especially chlamydia. Uh, chlamydia has something like um, only a, a, a five or a 4% uh, symptomatic rate. Meaning to say is out of all 100 females, female patients, only five or four of them will present with symptoms. So they could, and chlamydia is the number one STD in this country. Uh, so they could be walking around um, and uh, uh, the, um, the bacteria is doing damage to their reproductive system and they don't even know it, okay? And uh, so, so these things, it's good, especially with the patient, if they're sexually active to go through the screen. And I go, uh, especially in um, uh, people who have had, uh, already had their children, uh, always pelvic exam and uh, cervical cytology, All right? And we're uh, pelvic exam, and it's typically annually. And um, for the cervical cytology, that's another. That's a fancy. That's a fancy name for the Pap smear. And what's the Pap smear? That is the Papa Nicolo smear. And we're going to be talking about that in a moment. So again. Go over, watch a video, uh, go, go watch uh, uh, the videos of um, the National Breast Foundation or the Susan Coleman Foundation, right, uh, on breast exams. They're, they're all over YouTube. And they're really, they're really uh, good to perform and you should perform them monthly because again, 
um, who, who, who better than the patient, especially if they're uh, well-educated uh, with the breast health examination to tell us that something's wrong. Now, uh, another thing that we're always asking is uh, LMP or last menstrual period, because based on your LMP, uh, uh, we know a lot about fertility and we also know a lot about the hormonal activity of our patient. And remember, if your patient is um, uh, very active, like an athlete, uh, they may have menstrual uh, dysfunction because um, decreased body fat, uh, you have these decreased estrogen, decreased estrogen. If you recall your anatomy and physiology, you're going to have some menstrual cycle problems. Uh, another thing uh, regarding just real quick, domestic violence or any, if you're doing any examination, do not confront the patient. Uh, that's the physician's job. Your job is to um, properly document anything you see and hear okay you never write down oh i believe the patient is a victim of domestic violence just write down found some bruises here here and here i go i i informed my uh, i informed my physician i informed my nurse okay and be very careful because the abusive family member could be in the room okay i've had that happen to me a couple of times and uh of course don't don't ignore the problem and get it goes Get the problem to your physician, and uh, and and because many times the patient, when the when the doctor's not in the room, they let their guard down and they and they may share something with you. Remember, you have to document all of that. All right. Oh, here's a how to perform your breast self exam. Um, we'll uh, we'll go over that in laboratory, but please uh, go over this and also uh, watch the very nice videos, especially with the Susan Coleman Foundation which is um, a very large foundation here in the area um, regarding breast cancer. Now, what's a pelvic exam? Of course, that's uh, uh, also called an IE or internal examination. Uh, we're examining not only the outer uh, gen female genitalia, we're also, um, we're also using a speculum, which will uh, open up the vaginal introitus and then, so we can look at the vaginal uh, um, canal and, and the cervix. And those are the, those are the two main things that we're uh, watching out for when we're doing an internal examination. It is the uh, vaginal canal and the cervix. And of course, when we're doing our inspection, we're, we're looking for anything like genital warts, any uh, um, uh, abrasions, any other lesions, and again, um, um, use all your senses because there are certain STDs uh, such as pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, you'll definitely smell it and uh, you have to report it. So this is your speculum. And of course, uh, the doctor performs this. And this is the old school way of performing a pap smear. Nowadays, the pap smear looks like this. Well, that's your speculum, but I'm looking at, here it is. You see this brush here? And there's a long part and then there's short parts here. Well, if you can look at your imagination a little bit, the long parts are for the internal os right here in the middle. And let's make this a little, let's see if I can make this a little bigger. Can I? No, I can't. Well, here, that's it for the internal os. And then you have these sections here on the side, the brushes for uh, the side of uh, that tool, that's for the external os. And then on the sides of the brushes, we'll also brush against the vaginal canal. So those are the three, those are the three sections that you will need. You'll also go over um, your protocols to know what to set up. You'll set up, of course, your different probes here, and you can see the one, uh, it looks like a, a little uh, triangle, right? Uh, you have some forceps here, right? If, uh, just in case, is there some uh, minor bleeding? Of course, gloves. 
and oh, I don't know what this is, but this is of course KY and the three different uh, sizes of duckbill speculums. And there's a way to measure that and the optician knows how to do that. And um, these speculums either could be uh, stainless uh, so that it can be, um, um, uh, what do you call it, sterilized in an autoclave. Uh, but there are other offices that use plastic that are, you know, uh, disposable. Um, and those are for the offices that don't do uh, that many um, internal exams. There are also a thing you also need is, all, of course, the light. And you could see here another side view on how that probe here can go in there and get the, the cell samples. And then, you see this probe here? It goes inside this bottle and this top part breaks off. Okay? Uh, and you can look up videos. Uh, there's a whole bunch of videos on, on how that's actually done. And what's in that bottle, it's called a wet mount. It has preparatory solution uh, that makes sure that the cells don't, you know, uh, uh, don't get damaged so that they can analyze it in the lab. And that's a pap smear. And it's, uh, it's advised uh, uh, to have regular ones and it's a screening for cervical cancer. Especially if the patient has any history of human papillomavirus, uh, subtype 16 or 18. Um, some guidelines, eh, nice to know. Now, another thing you'll be doing in the uh, uh, obstetrics office is prenatal care. And the one thing that you have for every prenatal care visit, you have to have a, a urine cup ready. Uh, and, and take it, uh, uh, and, and because mommy will be urinating a lot, so uh, take it as they're walking in. Um, and if you don't need it, discard it, but nine times out of 10, uh, uh, you're gonna need it. And one of the things that we're always monitoring is any uh, urinary tract infection, because um, baby is gonna be pressing down on a lot of these structures here. It's not also going to help her make her urinate more. You can see here how it can also uh, um, uh, change the structure of the urinary bladder here, which could set up mommy for uh, the urinary tract infection. And those aren't good because uh, UTIs unchecked become a nephrology problem. Another thing you should also always have ready for your obstetrician is a tape measure. We do a fundic height which is a me measurement from uh, my patient's pubic symphysis, and you'll palpate here, and then all the way to the top part here, which is the fundus of their uterus, and that fundic height um, dictates if the baby is growing, uh, growing at the proper rate, okay? And here's the suggested, their monthly visits during the second trimester, and then it gets uh, every other week, and then once a week, at 36 weeks age of gestation. And again, it is your responsibility as a medical assistant or the front desk to make sure that gets scheduled uh, uh, correctly, okay? Because uh, prenatal care is one of the greatest predictors of a good delivery. Um, all my bad deliveries that I've ever had, uh, and fortunately or unfortunately, I'm one of the few internal medicine people you'll ever speak to who's delivered 38 children and because I was always awake in the um, uh, in the ER and I was servicing a high risk uh, high volume neighborhood and um, all the, the pregnancies that went poorly were every time I asked mommy when's the last time you've been to doctor and she was like mm, I don't know when they say I don't know that's very dangerous and then uh, and nine times out of ten it's bad bad Again, same thing with abuse. If you see any signs or symptoms of alcohol or drug abuse, again, do not confront your patient, right? Uh, and you can ask them, have you been drinking? Have you been doing drugs? If they say no, even though they're obviously high or, uh, or drunk, you have to write patient claims no alcohol or no drug abuse. But of course, on your physical examination, and uh, when you're talking about how the patient was acting, the patient had slurred speech, 
uh, didn't know where they were, uh, um, acting inappropriately, and then give an example. But remember, you do not do the diagnosis. Who does the diagnosis? The NP, the DO, or the MD, right? Not you, but you gather up all the data to help us because um, alcoholics and drug addicts, they're very, very good at hiding a lot of their symptoms and a lot of their signs. But uh, we're better at picking them up. And uh, if you spot it, of course, report it, write it down in your chart. And remember, the chart proves um, not only that we saw something, the chart, the function of the chart is to prove medical continuity, that we never left our patient to their own devices. So that if you missed uh, some signs that the patient was inebriated or high or drunk, uh, that's on you. You should be able to have enough training to notice that and to write it down uh, and also to help aid in the uh, future diagnosis. Labor, of course, delivery, sometimes we have to induce, okay? Uh, we're always promoting breastfeeding and breastfeeding and bottle feeding training. Nowadays, uh, um, uh, in this area, um, the breastfeeding class, the bottle feeding class, and also the, um, uh, what do you call that? The uh, car seat test, they're all mandatory. Uh, the uh, baby and mommy will not be released from the hospital un until that training gets signed off. And we're always looking at all the postpartum effects and the post, you have prenatal um, uh, visits, you should also make sure that mommy follows up with the postpartum visits because this is a lot of hard times for mommy and she needs all the support that she can, uh, especially in uh, the, uh, the weeks to come. And classic issues are the pain, the bleeding, right? And uh, the emotional stress, especially with uh, first time mommies. Um, and also the hormones are just really off because when you have a baby, all the hormones, everything is geared for baby, not mommy. And in postpartum, uh, you, you can, uh, it's very rare to have uh, um, postpartum psychosis, but it is, uh, it does happen. And, and with, uh, with a decent amount of patients, there's also a decent amount of postpartum depression because you know lack of sleep, taking care of baby, it's a, it's a lot of stress. So having uh, your postpartum uh, delivery, not postpartum delivery, having your postpartum visits is really important and uh, really important to follow up. Now, let's go over some of uh, some classic tests that we do in the obstetric and gynecological office. Of course, is the pregnancy test. And the pregnancy test is based on uh, the detection of HCG. HCG is human chorionic gonadotropin, right here, right? And that only comes out if you are pregnant. Well, it also comes out if you have hydatidiform mole, but that is so rare. Uh, but uh, you got HCG, you're, you're pregnant, okay? Now, as it states here, the test is in foolproof. So we take two types of tests and they have to corroborate with each other. Of course, you take the urine test, right? And we check your urine if there's HCG levels. And then we also check the blood, okay? So again, back to, uh, um, back to what I was always stating. If you go to an obstetrician's office, there's tons in the bathroom. There's always tons of, uh, of um, urine kits. And remember your MED-140, know how to use that kit, uh, um, uh, know how to properly instruct your patient on a clean, uh, on a clean catch method of, uh, of obtaining that urine. So of course, uh, screen for uh, STIs or STDs, sexually transmitted infections, because if mommy has an STD, baby's gonna have an STD. We have to be careful of radiologic tests because if mommy's pregnant, uh, what do you think radiation, like an X-ray, will do to mommy who's pregnant? It will uh, have teratogenic effects on baby. And a teratogen is something that uh, promotes cancer. And radiology on an unborn baby will definitely promote cancer. 
Um, we also uh, want to look at the fallopian tubes, the uterine tubes, right? Uh, but that's an x-ray exam. And again, we want to make sure mommy is not pregnant. Mammogram as well, that mommy is not, that uh, your patient is not pregnant. Now, once your patient is pregnant, we also have fetal screening. Uh, one of the things that we can look at is uh, if there's presence of alpha fetal protein or AFP. And that will, uh, the presence of AFP indicates um, uh, some sort of um, uh, neuroanatomic uh, problem. And the way we collect AFP is via amniocentesis. That's when we have that, let's, let's have a nice little review. See if I spelled it correctly. This is how you do amnio. First we do an ultrasound, right? This is ultrasound guided because I want to, actually this syringe is much, much bigger, right? Uh, oh, here's a better picture, right? I go in and I'm trying to only get the fluid and that's why I do ultrasound so that this, tro it's called the trocar, doesn't hit baby. Now, the amniotic fluid is what I want, right? And that's what we're doing, we're screening because we don't know if, um, if mommy has, a, uh, has a, a genetic disease, but if there's AFP present in that amniotic fluid, then that's a problem. And uh, that it's very likely that baby has a neural tube defect. We also screen for uh, Down syndrome and jellies. Uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of other um, chromosomal uh, diseases that we also look for in amniocentesis. And the rationale of doing that screen is to prepare mommy of what is going to come, okay? Uh, but remember, no matter what is going to come, mommy will always see baby as beautiful and as perfect, okay? So therefore, we should see them as. So whatever comes out in delivery, right? Um, I always relay the story. Um, I think my sixth or seventh delivery, I was already kind of used to delivering uh, uh, and I was in, uh, already in medical school when I started delivering babies. And um, I was in the ward and I had a, a woman from a poor socioeconomic background, no prenatal care. Uh, she also was a drug addict and the baby came out anencephaly, meaning the baby had no, uh, her brain was the, um, the calvarium or the skull was not really present and the brain was on the outside. And the infant looked more like I don't know, like a frog than a human being. And I remember the midwife next to me crying. And I was a little bit shocked because seeing it in a textbook is one thing, but seeing it in real life is, is kind of scary and kind of shocking. But we wrapped up the baby girl in the pink blanket and I put on, I guess I put on my bravest face. I asked the midwife to leave the room because uh, she was crying. And uh, mommy got to hold her baby until the baby passed. And uh, that is what we do. Um, we cannot predict what will happen, but we can be there for our patient. Uh, and um, um, it was really sad because um, at, right after her baby died, mommy disappeared. Uh, she absconded from the hospital, which is a typical story. Pap smear we already talked about, short for Papa Nikolu. Right, and we're looking at precancer cells, uh, and again, uh, it is a screening procedure and requires an internal examination. Amniocentesis, we already looked at that, and you can see it's ultrasound guided. We look also uh, ultrasound, which is a non-invasive test, and we do that regularly. And a lot, um, um, finding the sex of the baby, uh, there might be a penile bud right? But that doesn't necessarily mean it's male or female uh, yet. But the odds are if you find a, a penis or penile bud uh, and maybe a little bit of their scrotum, then of course it's going to be a boy. But if you don't see anything, it still could be a boy. Okay. 
Pap smear, already talked about that. Oh, here is what pap smear results is. This is nice to have if you're working in an obstetrics office because you're going to have a lot of questions about what do these words mean, okay? Now, of course, the only person who could really uh, um, uh, talk to the, uh, the patient is the doctor. But you need to understand when you read a report, what does um, this mean, right? So unsatisfactory means what? The test went bad. Whoever did it didn't get enough sample. Negative means what? We're good. Let's uh, do the pap smear uh, at the next scheduled time. Benign means there are no cancerous cells, but there's some signs of infection or some irritation. Sometimes you might see benign, comma, abnormal cells present or inflammation cells present. We're just going to monitor that. We're just going to look at that for a while, right? Again, go to the next uh, scheduled pap smear and we're going to just make sure that this thing stays benign. Now, when do we start repeating the pap smears and start really looking? When we look at things, the word atypical. That means there are definitely abnormal cells and the pap smear must be uh, repeated, okay? We also um, want to do an HPV test as well to detect to see if there's any human papillomavirus present, specifically subtype 16 and subtype 18, okay? Because if they have that, they, this is the reason why we don't have too many cervical cancers anymore because we pick up the cancer when? before it even happens, right? Low grade, again, when you were, see the words mild dysplasia, class means growth or repair, dys means abnormal. That means the, uh, there are way more abnormal cells and uh, it's, it's a little bit more serious. So these two things right here, that's serious. But if we have high grade, that means we jump right to biopsy. We'll uh, put in the speculum. We're going to have a colposcope and it's going to have a light. And then we're going to coat uh, the cervix with iodine. And anywhere that we see any abnormal coloration, we're going to take a biopsy of it. And of course, if it's positive for SCC or squamous cell carcinoma, then of course, uh, we're, uh, we're definitely going to uh, think about um, some treatment options. Okay. But so, when do we, it goes, if it's unsatisfactory, we repeat it. Negative and benign, we're just watching it. Atypical, we're just, I mean, negative and benign, we just continue, everything's cool, we go on to the next pap smear schedule. But if we have atypical cells, we repeat, and then HPV, okay? Low grade, definitely HPV. High grade, we jump right to biopsy, okay? Uh, Chorionic villus sampling is just like uh, amniocentesis. Again, we're looking for genetic disorders, right? Because um, uh, there's two layers of fluid and two layers uh, that separate baby from the rest of uh, mommy is the amnion and the chorion. So amniocentesis, we take uh, some fluid from the amnion. Chorion or chorion, uh, chorionic villus sampling uh, is uh, for genetic disorders. Biopsy, colposcopy, I mentioned colposcopy. Now, that's a colposcope. They're actually much, much smaller now. But we want to see the vaginal canal and we want to see it um, really uh, much, much closer, okay? Uh, so that we could see all the potential abnormal lesions and discolorations of the cervix, okay. So it's like a it's like it's like um like um a more like 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 binoculars uh for the vaginal canal and the cervix. That, that's the best way to put it. But nowadays this thing's huge. Uh, um, even when I had training twenty years ago, uh, it was much much smaller. Now DNC, what is it? Now these are some uh, things that we, uh, some procedures. Now, DNC stands for dilatation and curatage. Now, let's look, maybe on the next page they'll show it. 
No, they won't. Let's show it. So that's a DNC. Let's say we found something inside the cervix, inside the uterus that we don't like. Okay. So what must we do? We first have to uh, dilate the cervix. And how do we do that? We use a, dila a dilator. So there's this big like metal tube and it's got a, it has a soft hook on it so that it'll open up your cervix here. And this is of course your uterus. Now, what is a curette? The curette is this sharpened spoon. And what does it do is it'll scrape the lining, the top lining of the uterus. So let's say you have uh, outgrowth here or we want to take um, uh, endometrial biopsy of something on the inside. We have to scrape the inside of this. Or if there's a bunch of small polyps we want to get rid of, uh, we can do that. Now, another thing that we do, and again, uh, please, if, if, if uh, depending on um, uh, your religious beliefs and your religious practices, of course, don't participate if you do not want to participate in an abortion or a TOP termination of pregnancy. Because if there is a viable, uh, uh, if there's a, 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 um, a viable um, fetus or, uh, or, or what do they call it? Um, uh, cells of conception. If I scrape at this, what will happen? Of course, you will remove it. And then there are times that, of course, that the TOP or termination of pregnancy is warranted. Let's say, for example, in an ectopic pregnancy, where it's maybe uh, in the wrong part of the uterus and it's now endangering mommy. We would perform a DNC, a dilatation, and curatage to, uh, um, uh, to remove the abortus or to remove um, um, you know, the cells there that are potentially harming uh, uh, the mother. So that's what a DNC is. Hysterectomy, we actually do, we remove the uterus and uh, we do that for a number of reasons and most likely it's cancer. Laparoscopy, that's a laparoscope. Look at what a laparoscope does. Laparoscopies are neat because I don't have to do massive surgery. See how I can only have to put two little, well, three little um, holes in your abdomen. So I have one to view, one to do stuff, and another one to introduce either water or air uh, into the cavity. So instead of just open you, in, open you all the way like this with a big incision, we could do these little holes and it'll be easier. Um, it'll be easier on you for the patient. And also with our technology nowadays, you can record it uh, and the fiber optics are so thin and we could do uh, some, uh, some surgeries uh, nowadays uh, in between all of that. Okay, and that's a laparoscopy. And typically we use it to also just to look around because uh, we want to see if there's any physical barrier to infertility. LEAP, which is loop electrosurgical excision procedure. Um, uh, we do LEAP. Uh, we can cut things using uh, a cautery machine, which is like an electrical, it heats up uh, these electrical coils and we can, let's say there's polyps inside the uterus of my patient. We can kind of like burn them out, which is neat. We could also use cryosurgery, which uses these, um, uh, there, there are these chemical tips on, this, on these long sticks. So if you see something that looks like a match that has either, that has like blue or gray on it, please do not touch that with your bare hands because the chemical will freeze anything uh, on your hands. I found that out the hard way. I bumped in, I thought it was a match, so I touched it but uh, when I was a medical assistant and it burned my fingers. Now, just like there's breast self-examination, BSE, you also have a testicular self-examination, TSE. And this is in the Department of Urology because uh, it's, um, uh, testicular cancer is more rare than, um, 
than breast cancer, but it's just as deadly. So you also should be able to teach your patient on how to systematically review, uh, you know, and, and also tell your male patient, you got to look down there every once in a while and uh, feel around down there every once in a while to make sure that uh, um, everything's on the up and up. And what are they looking for? Any masses, any lumps, any bumps, any warts, any, I guess, any skin lesions that weren't there the month before. And again, just like with breast self-examination, we typically ask the patient, um, you know, look at it um, uh, monthly, okay? Uh, you know, while you're in the shower uh, or while you're getting changed. Now, urology, of course, urine and blood tests, semen analysis and smears, okay? What are we looking, uh, what are we looking at semen, uh, semen analysis? We, uh, in semen analysis, we're not only looking at number, we're also looking at motility. How well do the sperm actually move around? And there's, uh, there's tests for that. Um, we also have cystoscopy, okay? Let me show you what that is. Just like uh, women have colposcopy, they stick a tube uh, uh, in the vagina for, um, uh, for um, clinical purposes, right? We can do the same thing for male through the urethral opening of the penis. And then we can go there and we can look at the bladder. And uh, remember the root word for bladder is cyst. So this is a cystoscopy. We could also take biopsies here, especially for certain STDs. If my pay, uh, that's old school. Nowadays, they just use urinalysis and, um, and, and blood tests. But old school, we, when I was doing training, I used to stick a wire loop in there. And then you put it on a, um, um, uh, like a, a, a glass plate, and then you could send it to the lab. And then they look, or heck, I just take it and look at it in the microscope, and I could tell you if you have stuff. Uh, of course, testicular biopsy works in the same way, right? If I'm goes, uh, if I find a mass, I have to take a biopsy of it, and we do it the same way as we do it with breast with a uh, syringe. Um, hmm, eh, common obstetric diseases. Nice to know, because we're more about we're more about the um, um, the tests because that's what this class is about. The tests and what are the things that we do for these tests? Sexually transmitted infections, STIs or STDs. Now, this is the thing that I was talking to you about. That the um, was it the blue book has. At the end, in, in the blue book, if you look up chapter 39, it has all of these rubrics. And a rubric is what to do, what are the steps. And it shows you a nice little uh, a picture on how you are supposed to set up your mayo tray. And this is called a mayo tray. And you can see this is an emesis bowl, uh, you know, for vomiting, but we also use it to, um, uh, you know, to collect specimen and things of that matter. Of course, you have uh, the diff you have your speculum, you have your KY, you have your gloves, and uh, you have, of course, the uh, wet mount or the fixative for these um, applicators that are here. Uh, you remember that like trident brush that I showed you? That's what this thing is. Okay, so read through these, and uh, so when we go into the laboratory, it'll be a little bit easier when we look at stuff. Here's the plastic version of a speculum, remember, these are disposable. Once you open up the bag, you gotta use it or you gotta throw it out. Oh, I forgot to mention, remember your MED-140 skill set when you label things. Make sure the label is filled out. Do it before you, uh, uh, you utilize all of these things. Uh, I like doing it before because sometimes the fixative spills over and things like that. And uh, I don't know, uh, it makes me remember uh, to do this because how many times uh, I forget and get into a lot of trouble uh, if you forget. And let's say you don't have that much time, right? When you fill out the form, make sure it has at least some identifier of the patient, either date of birth or social security number. So name, of course, 
uh, uh, first and last name of the patient, but at least have date of birth or at least have a uh, social or some sort of identifier because you really don't want to lose that specimen. Um, pregnant patient, cervical biopsy, we already talked about. So this is at the end of the chapter. And also at the end of the chapter, you have some really nice questions which um, they mirror uh, your um, um, AMA, AAMA, C, uh, CM, uh, CMA exams. So this is a nice thing to look at and you could collect them all uh, and, and just uh, try them out. Um, because remember, how do, how do you practice for a multiple choice examination? You take as many multiple choice examinations uh, as you can. Okay, so that concludes this uh, chapter 39 and the obstetrics. Know that all the tests and, and what do they do and what's due next week, of course. Discussion four and quiz four, okay? Now, if I give you a zero for the quiz, please, I goes, please look at it uh, because sometimes the... Um, uh, the, the what do you call that? The grading system within Moodle uh, doesn't inform me or it's missing. I don't know. Sometimes it's a glitch, but uh, please do your quizzes. Uh, please do your do discussions. Remember, they're like 30% of your grade. And also look out this week for, um, um, for the uh, laboratory times and, and, and follow the directions to email me back on confirmation that you're going to the laboratory. Okay. All right, with that said, uh, is there any questions? All right, no comment, questions. nothing. If nothing good, please get, uh, get your quiz three and discussion three done by closing a business today so I can give you full credit. And I'll see you guys next week. All right, bye. Have a good one. You too.